My most memorable moment was I returned match figures of none for 140 on debut. <laughs> and they picked me for the next test. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Kerry O'Keefe Show on YouTube. It's my first effort. Bear with me. But it's great to have your company. I'm hoping that you'll join me each week uh, for this YouTube show. Uh, it's new territory for me, uh, but I'm so enthusiastic about how it might go. Um, looking forward to your company each week. I turned 67 last week. At my age, it's great to have any company. <laughs> so although we're not in the same room, I see you as company, apart from my wife and dogs. Uh, but uh, a few nights ago, late, very late, uh, extremely late. In fact, early one morning, <laughs> I thought it'd be a good idea to just give my thoughts each week on YouTube. And uh, it was decided uh, later on that afternoon that this would be the first episode. Um, I'll be discussing a wide range of subjects over the weeks, uh, molecular research, uh, the foreign policies of small European countries, uh, how to uh, get our country into surplus. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It'll be a simple show. Cricket, books, movies, life, anything that catches my fancy. Or catches your fancy, because I'm looking forward to fielding your questions on Twitter. Um, if you're... And we'll start with this week's Twitter question from Matt Anderson of Sydney. And Matt asked, when will Devlin Malone wear the green and gold? Very good question. Uh, for those outside of Sydney who don't know who Devlin Malone is, uh, he'll probably play for Australia pretty soon. <laughs> well, he's from Sydney. Um, he's an 18-year-old Wonderkin leg spinner who was the leading wicket taker in Sydney grade cricket, uh, who took 10 wickets uh, in an innings last year in a second grade match as a teenager. Uh, he is an extreme talent. I think the Melbourne Stars have already signed him to a BBL contract. Well done, Sydney Thunder, Sydney Sixers. <laughs> What's going on there? Uh, given that he's from Janali, not far from where Steve Smith was raised. But this is an extraordinary talent. He's only a jockey size. He's five foot four, 165 centimetres tall. Hugh Bowman and Chris Muntz are taller than him, but he's taller than Mini Me. <laughs> uh, by quite some distance, given that Mini Me was two foot eight, it wouldn't take a lot to be taller than Mini Me. Uh, Devlin is diminutive, but he has the wrong end from heaven. And Shane Watson faced it last year and said it was the best wrong end he'd ever uh, seen. And the fact that he didn't see it meant that it was better than that. <laughs> because it bowled him three times out of four. Uh, Devlin Malone has played underage New South Wales cricket. Uh, he is uh, on the radar strongly. When will we see him? Don't know. Bowls flat, as you'd expect, under the eye line leg spin with lots of wrong ones and change-ups. Uh, very skillful bowler. I think we'll see him in the Big Bash this year. Uh, his pathway will probably be short form. Matador Cup next year, maybe a Sheffield Shield game at some stage, but destined. You've got to do something different as a spinner in short form cricket. Devlin Malone is different. Just as Brad Hogg was different and was able to play at the age of 42 in short form, he had quick arm, uh, unpickable Roman. That's exactly what Devlin Malone has. The other one on the radar, of course, is Arjun Nair, also an 18 year old, who has the off spinner and the Dusra. Took eight wickets in Sydney first grade cricket yesterday in an innings. Uh, again, another who's very much on the radar of the national selection panel. He's played for the Cricket Australia 11 and did well in the Matador Cup. Uh, and he'll continue to get opportunities. He's only 18. Finger spinners normally reach their peak late 20s. Lots of time for Arjun there and he bats as well. You've got to do something, as I said, different if you're going to cut it in short form cricket. Uh, Adam Zampa keeps the ball below the eye line. 
uh, bowls lots of pace variation, good wrong and bowls full, gets protection with his field, very high success rate. Um, think that you know he's the benchmark for Devlin Malone and Arjun Nair to try and get past. Um, very interested if they can. But Matt Anderson's question is genuine. When will Devlin Malone wear the green and gold? Don't know. But the fact that he will at some stage, you would think, would be a triumph for those who are quite challenged. <laughs>Let's look at the Australian Test Series loss to South Africa. South Africa won the first two and Australia won the consolation pink ball day-night test in Adelaide. Um, we just didn't bat well enough and they bowled well. Uh, they scored five centuries in the three Test Series, we scored one. Usman Kawaja, a match winning 145. What an innings it was, he averaged 52 in the series. He was the real plus in the batting, um, Uzi at three. Uh, Kyle Abbott, Kagisa Rabada and Vernon Philander, they maintained pressure throughout the two wins. They only eased it with the pink ball, which was surprising. Philander got tired uh, and Rabada was less precise than he was in the first two and Australia got away. That's the key to beating Australia. If you maintain pressure with the moving ball, uh, you get you pick wickets and that's what they did. Um, the best for Australia with the, with the rock was Josh Hazelwood, 17 at 22.5. He swung it, he seamed it. Bowled a Glenn McGrath trajectory. Trajectory is everything in bowling. Um, Glenn McGrath could get people out at 118 kilometres per hour because he had the trage. Um, Tiger Woods, playing well this week, hitting good trage. I love that word trajectory. I use it all the time. <laughs> when I play golf, I say good trage. Uh, but trajectory is key. It's the up, down, up again. And that's, the, that's why Hazelwood, even though he's a lesser pace than Mitchell Stark, maybe is a superior bowler. Just as Jason Gillespie was almost as good as Glenn McGrath. Um, interesting pairing that. McGrath Gillespie, we've got that with Stark Hazelwood. Uh, Stark, the extreme pace, flat trajectory, but the, the crushing Yorker and the searing bouncer. Very good balance. Uh, big fan of Hazelwood. Um, the Series 2 was, uh, unfortunately, there was some carnage along the way. Scapegoats uh, were made of a number of players. Adam Burgess, Callum Ferguson, Joe Minnie, Peter Neville. It's a bad term in sport, scapegoats. Um, the selectors said, or ostensibly said, we want to bring in a bit of mongrel. So they introduced Matthew Wade, basically because Paul Gallen was unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> Same sort of keeping skills, uh, but no, that's unkind. Matt Wade much improved. Um, but does Mungrel equate to commenting on every ball that Nathan Lyon bowls? Uh, it's wearing thin in the lounge rooms around Australia. If if Gaz bowls a half volley outside of stump, which is stroked quietly to cover for no run, he doesn't deserve a bowling gazer. And he got that five out of six. Uh, it's a false dawn because it's not great bowling. Um, uh, Rod Marsh was my wicket keeper throughout my career. 24 tests with Marshy behind the sticks. He never described any of my deliveries back to me. Um, uh, over after over, I was ripping leg spinners, uh, wrongens, flippers, without a word coming from behind the stumps. I like that. Although occasionally he'd walk past me at the end of the, an over and say, could you give me something to do? <laughs> uh, they were the days, but scapegoat. I mean, that's shocking, uh, you know, when Slick was so we had to make scapegoats. I remember in 1974-75 at the Gabba, I was 12th man when Jeff Thompson absolutely obliterated the Poms. Thompson and Lily, it was the start of that two year reign. And I carried the drinks well. I was good, I was very good. I didn't spill one Powerade in four, five days. It was a fabulous bit of work by me, given the state I was in. <laughs> oh, but at the end of it, we'd won, a, I was pouring the boys lots of uh, 
a, a winner's drink. And uh, I thought, wow, isn't this a juggernaut I'm going to enjoy riding? Because the Poms were shattered after one test, there was four to go. We were going to win this series 5-0 or 4-1 if there was consolation. Uh, and I thought, wow, I'm part of this unit. And then uh, after two hours, uh, I, the chairman looked at his and said, Kerry, you're not playing, in the, uh, you're not going to Perth for the second test, which was a bit of a bummer. And a pressman came in shortly after and said, Skull, would you care to comment on your omission from the 12th of Perth? And I said, scapegoat. <laughs> <laughs> so I now have Callum Ferguson, Joe Many, Peter Neville and Adam Burgess Phil. I too was a scapegoat. It was a victory uh, by 258 runs, but you can still be a scapegoat. <laughs> there are 21 cricket books on the market this Christmas. That's a lot. Most of them are diaries. Uh, Although there's one called Coach that was written by a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, and marketing took days to come up with that one. But it's a winner. But the two I've read uh, are Jim Maxwell's The Sound of Summer and Mark Nicholas's A Beautiful Game. I'll deal with the first one. Former colleague of mine, 13 years with Jimmy M. Loved every minute of it. He's written a book, The Sound of Summer. It starts brilliantly and then tails off a little. Um, I wrote the foreword. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. With all due respect, it's a very good read. It talks about Jim's, well, consuming love of the game, uh, his life in cricket, his journey with ABC Radio, Peter Roebuck Reflections, the future of the game. Uh, and, and there's a lot of anecdotes about uh, on to a life that you may not know about Mr. Jim Maxwell. He's recently been in poor health, but he's recovering well. I wish him uh, the best with this book. Uh, there are aspects of it I didn't know, and having known him for about 40 years uh, and having worked with him for 13, it was great to, to, to read a few things about him that I didn't know and his thoughts on things. He's not a great lover of short form cricket. He's a test man, but he's neither, neither a dinosaur uh, or one that wants to sort of uh, deflect away from where the popularity uh, of short form cricket is going. Um, I, I like this book, particularly uh, the opening. The second book I want to commend to you is A Beautiful Game by Mark Nicholas, also known, of course, as Smashing. He's the guy you see when you turn on your television uh, to watch Channel 9's cricket. I don't know why he never rates well in most popular commentator. It's always down with the cap catchers. Shouldn't be, because he is the best professional cricket presenter in the country by 20 lengths. I've always been a big fan. I played against Mark Nicholas in 1978 at a Wabba Oval just out of Newcastle. I liked him from the outset. I liked his style. I've always liked his style. He scored 20,000 first class runs but didn't play a test for England. You're starting from behind at Channel 9 if that's your CV. But through his own professionalism and hard work, he is now the lead presenter on that uh, cricket presentation. Well done him. He's written a book about his time in the game. Lots of highlights in this book. I think you'll enjoy them. Um, he, 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 because he played with and against some of the best players in the modern game, he has insights that very few have, just personal experiences. He talks about them. He played with people like Malcolm Marshall, uh, the late Malcolm Marshall, who he much admired at Hampshire. He talks about Robin Smith, the former England early order batsman, uh, and, and his sad tale, but on the road back, uh, R. Smith. Uh, he talks about Kerry Packer and his uh, meetings with him, about meeting Bradman, which was a fascinating story. I like this book. It's, he's a very good writer, apart from being a, a very good television man. He reflects with Jeff Boycott about things like um, the geniuses of cricket. And Jeff Boycott 
a lot of people uh, are polarised by him and the way he supposedly played, but he has a great eye for the game. And he, he said, when questioned by Mark, um, how many geniuses have you seen in your time in the game? And he named, I've only seen three. He named Gary Sobers, Bib Richards, and Brian Lara. Interesting, three West Indian batsmen. He left out Morley, he left out Warren, he left out Tengulka. So only genius came uh, through Sobers, Lara, and Vivian Richards. Interesting. He talked to Tendulka and Viv Richards about a floating technique when they batted. Um, Mark said, I only experienced it once or twice in my life. And that floating technique is when you're batting and the ball comes out of the bowler's hand and you know instinctively what shot you're going to play, where the ball is going to land, and the result of each shot. Uh, batsmen go through that phase occasionally. It's a Zen state of mind. It's a very interesting state of mind and he explores it uh, and it, it's known as floating. Uh, I don't know how many out there have been batting and have been floating. Uh, I never experienced it but um, I wasn't as good as the people that he spoke to about it. it, it it's, it's probably the ideal in batting. If the ball is running in and you are in a Zen state of mind where you know where every ball is going to be and what shot to play with success. I think this is good. He talks about Keith Miller, Dennis Compton, and Colin Ingleby McKenzie, his former captain at Hampshire, and their great love of life. Uh, and he talks about them, their love of Terps, Turf, and Totty. Uh, I didn't know, I knew the first two Terps, drinking, Turf, thoroughbred racing, and Totty, which is, um, in layman's terms, pulling chicks. <laughs> And Keith Miller, Dennis Compton, and Colin Ingleby McKenzie is the trifecta, apparently, since 1950 that few would challenge in that regard. But I commend this book, A Beautiful Game by Mark Nicholas. Uh, it's a good read, uh, as is The Sound of Summer by Jimmy Maxwell. Um, two goodbyes for Chrissy. One day is against New Zealand, just about to start, and then Test Cricket resumes with three tests against Pakistan. They'll be pivotal tests because the Tour to India awaits. The top six batsmen for that final test in Sydney on what could be a very big turning pitch will, will most likely be the six that go to India. So it's crucial they get the mix right. Matthew Renshaw is there. I think he's, even though Sean Marsh is on the horizon, and maybe back for the third test. It may not be in place of Matt Renshaw, who has this uh, stickability which they've craved since Chris Rogers left. Um, I'm a big fan of Matt Renshaw. He has strokes. Uh, he lacks rhythm. That's the problem. He's either dotting it or hitting it down the ground for six. We didn't see that in Adelaide in his first test because he said he put away the cover drive, which is sad. Um, I played 24 tests as a leg spinner. I wish I hadn't put away the leg spinner. <laughs> <laughs> I may have been more effective. But Matt Renshaw should have essayed a few more cover drives than he did because his, uh, uh, his trigger movement to, for forward defence meant that he played and missed a little too much. Um, he, that has to be a quicker and, and, and more pronounced trigger movement to cover off stuff. But that was well discussed by Channel 9. Ad infinitum. <laughs> <laughs> but Sean Marsh on the horizon, Nick Maddinson will be the player under pressure at six. Because I'm a bit of a fan of Sean Marsh. He lacks rhythm as well. He's either dotting it or hitting it for boundaries. But he is an outstanding slow pitch player as he showed in Sri Lanka. It's amazing that you can come from the whacker and be such a very good player on slower decks. Tom Moody was just such a player. Michael Hussey was just such a player. And Sean Marsh, surprisingly, is that sort of player. Much more at home on dry, crusty turners. I'm a bit of a fan. I know he's early 30s and he's had a, a horrendous run with injuries. But if we're going to India uh, in the new year, he has got to be in your thoughts because he handles the turning ball. The challenge will be for people like Usman Khawaja who freezes in the headlights 
uh, when confronted with off-spin on a turning pitch, Graham Swan um, was a particular problem for him. And they're awaiting us in India. Ravi Ashwin, Ajar Deja, and the new off-spinner Yadav, who made mincemeat of the England left-handers. How many left-handers could we fill in that first test on what we know? Eight! <laughs> Horses for courses, uh, eight lefties so that they just salivate over them. Got to get some right handers in there. Why are we taking so many left handers to India when they know they love bowling to them? Hmm. It's like saying, Winks is good in the wet. Let's get him to swim the English Channel. <laughs> just kidding, Winks. But we've got to get some right handers and they have to present themselves in the next few weeks. Cameron Bancroft has not got enough runs this year, but he has rhythm and he should be in a top six. He has runs uh, on the subcontinent as well on Australian aid tours. And Hilton Cartwright, watched him play at the SCG on real Bunsen. He looked, the, he looked the genuine article in the middle order. I'm a big fan of H Cartwright. He, he has the game to go over the fence, but he also stays still and plays late when it's turning. Um, I'm trying not to mention New South Welshman here, which is very difficult. <laughs> Given earlier in the broadcast, I had Devlin Malone playing for Australia within months at AD. However, uh, look, um, th these will be very interesting tests against Pakistan. Nick Maddinson needs runs. There are right-handers waiting to come in. I think we should have to look at a couple of them, as I've said. Bancroft, Hilton, Cartwright. Um, the wicket keepers on the horizon, if it's not to be Matthew Wade, interesting Sam Harper from Victoria, very gifted. And another left-hander, sadly, Jake Doran, who's just starting to find his feet for Tasmania, raised in Fairfield, uh, New South Wales. But uh, Australian under-19 captain has taken a while to mature, but if he fully does, the selectors will have their eye on him. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me.